Professor Michio Kaku is a familiar face to television viewers. Aside from being a professor of physics at the City University of New York and one of the developers of string theory, he is an expert communicator on the science of the future and author of a number of best-selling books. In his latest work, Kaku says that for humanity to have a long-term future, we must ultimately leave Earth. The book is called The Future of Humanity, Terraforming Mars, Interstellar Travel, Immortality, and Our Destiny Beyond Earth. And Professor Michio Kaku joins us now. Welcome to Chicago Tonight. Glad to be on. Um, so in the, your new book, you write that it is inevitable that uh, humanity will meet its end, the Earth will become inhabitable for humans, and that we can either leave, adapt, or die. This all sounds scary. When and how is all of this happening? Well, you know, the dinosaurs did not have a space program. That's why they're not here today. <laughs> they didn't have plan B. They didn't have an insurance policy. We do have plan B. We have a space program capable of going to the moon, Mars, and perhaps even beyond. Now, NASA, of course, has been criticized for being the agency to nowhere. It doesn't go anywhere. That's all changed. Get this, starting next year, we go back to the moon. That's official now, December 2019, back to the moon, and then Mars, and who knows, beyond that. And that'll give us an insurance policy, just in case something bad happens. And I want to come back to NASA a little bit more as well. Um, but you view that it is our destiny to explore and to colonize other planets. But some people push back and say, you know what, this Earth has a lot of problems. We need to deal with those right here and right now. Um, why is space exploration and ultimately colonization so important? Well, you know, I once talked to Carl Sagan about this. And he said, look, we got to settle Earth problems on Earth. These are political problems like global warming. Going to outer space is not going to solve global warming. However, he said, we should become at least a two-planet species because we have to have a settlement there in case something does bad happens to the planet Earth. Meteorite impacts. We can also have supervolcanoes. We can also have ice ages take place. And five billion years from now, the sun will eat up the Earth. It's practically a law of physics that one day our days on the earth will be over. And that's why we want to make sure that humanity survives all these disasters. So creating a settlement on Mars, what will that take? That sounds uh, hard. Well, to go to the moon is a piece of cake these days. Three days to the moon, uh, you leave on Monday, come back on the weekends. So now, going to Mars is more difficult. Mars is two years away. Nine months to go to Mars, then you have to do experiments and wait for the time to be right to come back. Another nine miss months for the trip back. So we're talking about initially pretty hardy people. These are astronauts, they're trained scientists, they're people who know it's going to be a two years, very serious journey to Mars. So we're looking at video right now from SpaceX, uh, Elon Musk's space exploration company. What will be and what has been the role of private enterprise from billionaire visionaries like Elon Musk and Richard Branson and Steve Bezos? They've changed everything. The price of space travel has gone down because of these billionaires. That moon rocket, uh, the Falcon Heavy, millions of people tuned into that Falcon Heavy rocket. That was a moon rocket. And how much did it cost taxpayers? Nothing. It was free because it was paid for by Elon Musk. Now, space travel is so cheap that the movie The Martian, many people saw that movie with Matt Damon, that cost $100 million. However, to go to Mars, the Indians did it with $70 million. So they ought to give an Oscar for the best supporting space probe. Hollywood movies today cost more than sending a probe to Mars. So it sounds like then the, the, the private enterprise is kind of doing some of this research for humanity because they can afford to. That's right. And remember the used car industry? That revolutionized car ownership after the World War II. Well, now we're going to have reasonable rockets, compliments of Elon Musk. You saw that Falcon Heavy take off. The two booster rockets came back to Earth, ready for the next journey to the moon. And again, that was a moon rocket. That was not the shuttle. That was the moon rocket that blasted off from Cape Canaveral for free.
Um, so you write about the idea of terraforming Mars to make it more hospitable for humans and, and more habitable for humans. How, how do you do that? Well, we are actually terraforming the Earth right now. <laughs> With global warming, for the worse, we're actually changing the weather patterns on the planet Earth. We can terraform Mars for the better. We can, for example, in the future, not anytime soon, but launch satellites that will beam sunlight onto the polar ice caps. Mars has plenty of water, but it's in frozen form. We can melt the ice caps by shooting sunlight onto the ice caps so that rivers and lakes flow freely on the surface of Mars. Mars once had an ocean the size of the United States of America. That's how much water Mars had, but it's all frozen. We can unfreeze it. Now, this would be a pretty big project, obviously, something on a scale that humans have, humans have never undertaken before and require years, years, decades, maybe hundreds of years of commitment. How do we get society and humanity to commit to something that might not be seen until our great, 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 great grandchildren are around? Well, it's going to happen anyway. Because uh, all of a sudden we have Silicon Valley billionaires financing it. Elon Musk has his Falcon Heavy rocket. And also Jeff Bezos, the richest man on Earth, has his own spaceport. He doesn't have to go to Cape Canaveral. He launches from Texas. And he has a fleet of rockets. We may have a traffic jam. A traffic jam over the moon. And uh, we also have Richard Branson of Virgin Atlantic fielding his rocket, which will take tourists into outer space. I wouldn't be surprised if one day people have honeymoons on the moon. Going to the moon is not going to be such a big deal. Three days and you can have this glorious honeymoon on the moon. And to pay for it, Google billionaires are not jumping in. They don't want to be left out either. Why should Bezos and, and Musk have all the fun? They're funding asteroid mining. They want to capture a small asteroid, maybe 50 feet across, mine it for $50 billion worth of platinum and rare earth elements. So Google does not want to be left out either, and that's going to help pay for many of these missions. Now, President Trump, he has declared his mission to uh, send astronauts back to the moon. Do we need to do this as part of research and development on the way to colonizing and, and to building a base on Mars? Well, I'm all for robots. Uh, robots are cheap. They go out and they don't have to come back. However, robots are very limited in what they can do. We've sent several robots to Mars and they still can't dig in the soil. They still can't do basic physics experiments because it's very limited what robots can do. Humans could just blow the whole thing open. We could create a Mars base. We could create all sorts of facilities, power plants, and agricultural centers and farms to make it self-sufficient. Self so we're talking about using genetically modified plants to create farms on Mars so we don't have to ship food to the astronauts. They can grow food with genetically modified plants. Uh, NASA went to the moon 50 years ago, and if you had asked some people then, they thought we'd be living in the space age by now. What happened? Has NASA lost its way? No, what happened was the Cold War was over, and we, we forget the cost of space travel back then. You realize that in 1966, the NASA budget was 5% of the total federal budget. That's unsustainable. 5% of every dollar went to the space program. Now it's 0.5%. And as I mentioned, Silicon Valley billionaires are footing the bill. And so we're talking about a whole new era uh, economics have changed totally, and these rockets are reusable. Space travel could go down by a factor of 10. So with the discovery of thousands of planets beyond our solar system, that means the search for other intelligent life, other aliens, um, has intensified. What is the likelihood that we will have definitive proof of this other life? I think that, yeah, I think the aliens are out there. I get a lot of emails from people that say that they've been abducted by flying saucers, so they've met the aliens. I tell them, the next time you're abducted by a flying saucer, steal something. 
I don't care what it is, an alien paperweight, an alien pencil, steal anything so you have bragging rights afterwards. <laughs> you can prove this actually happened. That's right. So, yeah, I think they're out there because we have discovered 4,000 planets going around other stars. On average, get this, on average, every single star you see at night has a planet going around it. On average, 100% of the stars you see at night have a planet going around it and a fraction of them are Earth-like. So I think, yeah, we have twins out there, twins of the Earth. When you go home tonight, look out in the night sky, somebody is looking back. Should be a clear night as well. If we do detect signs of life beyond Earth, especially intelligent life, how, how will that change us? Oh, it'll change us completely. I'll stick my neck out. I think in this century we'll pick up a radio transmission, we'll eavesdrop on some communication between alien civilizations. Now, are they going to land on the White House lawn and announce their existence? Probably not. I don't think so. <laughs> if you're in the forest, do you go to the squirrels and deer and try to talk to them? Well, at first, but eventually you get bored because they don't talk back. In the same way, I think aliens will land on the Earth and kind of get bored with us because we have nothing to offer them. If you see an anthill, do you go down to the ants and say, I bring you trinkets, I bring you bees, I give you nuclear energy, take me to your ant queen, or maybe you want to step on a few of them. So I think that if they're that advanced, we're not on the radar screen. Not just yet. All right. And once again, thank you, uh, Dr. Michio Kaku, for joining us. Once again, the book is The Future of Humanity, Terraforming Mars, Interstellar Travel, Immortality, and our destiny beyond Earth. You can read an excerpt on our website.